with five seconds. He's going to throw it. Howard leaps. He has it. Touchdown, Carolina. Back from the dead to tie the game with two seconds to go. Snap back, spot down. The kick is cleanly away. It is good. And it's Carolina <laughs> with yes, a 54 yard field goal. And how about them Tar Heels? They do it! Here's Kupak. Gives off to Amos. He's yes. good! He's, He's good! good. He's good! He's good! He's good! Unbelievable! Unreal! Jordan back to kick. It's blocked again! Picked up! It'll be a touchdown, Carolina, for Bracey Walker! He blocks his second punt! Bernard fields it at the 26, heading to the far side, Gio at the 35, Gio, he's at the 50, no he's not, yes he is, Gio, he's gonna take it for a touchdown, are you kidding me? This is the Heel Tough Blog Podcast on Spreaker.com. Hey guys, and welcome into this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. Anthony Pagnotta here with you guys as always, and joined once again by my buddy and my partner in crime for tomorrow's game against NC State, Josh Marlowe. We are back. We are back in our humble abode in Keenan Stadium. Yeah, it never ceased to fail that we find our way to make our... We got it, man. We love them too much. Make our our uh, voyage back to the homeland that is Keenan Stadium to watch the Heels take on the Wolfpack. Well, I have to shout out my boss over at WFNZ, uh, Tony Hitman Giacomo, and the First Lady, Diana, for hooking me up with these tickets. Uh, thanks for coming through in the clutch, guys, and we get to go see the Tar Heels play against NC State who may or may not be our biggest rival. We'll talk about that later in the show. But first, we have to get into the Western Carolina game. I know, thrilling. A 49-26 victory at home over Western Carolina. And, you know, second win of the year, I think something that at least gets momentum going in the right direction. Don't really know how much you can take away from this because, yes, this was in fact a win over a 3-7 and seven FCS team. But at the same time, Carolina ran the football very well. Nathan Elliott had a pretty decent day passing the ball but did throw two interceptions. So still a little bit concerning there, but at the same time was able to throw the ball down the field a little bit. So, you know, I know that, you know, we weren't, neither one of us were really able to see this game in full capacity. I caught, I I was able to get most of it in um, late night after all the other games had finished up. But, you know, just from, you know, really, you know, what you saw and, and maybe a little bit of checking out the box score, you know, what did you think of the performance for Carolina in their second win of the season against Western? Um, I thought they did offensively what they, what we wanted them to do. You know, you know, we were pretty much after the Duke game. We should have run the ball, make that the focal yeah. point of our offense. Mm-hmm. I think they rushed for over 300 yards in that game. Multiple guys got action with the game being out of hand late. But um, on a, offensively, doing what we wanted them to do, building some confidence, finding out some more stuff that works, to really to prepare for NC State. Defensively, I know they have a guy, their quarterback, like led the conference that he plays in in rushing. And he's the quarterback, and he had, you know, he had, a, he had you know, we gave him 26 yeah, points, yeah. which isn't, which isn't great. Now, granted, a lot of that was a lot of guys getting reps, probably taking some pressure off defensively late in the game, but still not a, a another underwhelming performance defensively. But overall, you know, you got out of there with a win. I know a couple guys got it banged up, so that's not good. But ultimately, they got their second win of the season. Well, I mean, the, one of the main things, the reason they scored 26 points, three turnovers, yeah. not, not really a fantastic day holding on to the football, but what it, what matters is it's a big win. It gets a little bit of momentum going in the right direction um, for the state game, which, of course, will break down. Uh, you know, the backfield, really just a fantastic performance. All the guys that we saw back there, again, Michael Carter, um, who actually does end up getting injured, so we are hoping for the best with that. Antonio Williams didn't play, so that kind of led way to 
some of the other guys getting reps. You saw Jordan Brown, who had a nice day. He seemed to sort of reestablish himself in that backfield after he was kind of absent there for a little while during the middle part of the season. But then Javante Williams, what a fantastic performance for him. Uh, you know, led the team in rushing with 93 yards rushing and three touchdowns on the day. Uh, I mean, you know, he really stepped up. And then in the final drive, you see British Brooks come in, who's a walk-on true freshman, and ends up leaving the game with seven carries for 57 yards. So really an all-around great performance from the backfield, and especially from Javante Williams. I mean, at this point, you know, the the backfield has to have you feeling somewhat confident going forward, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think offensively it's the strength of the team. Um you could literally return every running back that's on the roster for mm-hmm. next season. Um, they've had the issue, I guess, distributing carries. But, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Javante Williams looks like a guy that once Jordan Brown, Antonio Williams, and those guys are gone, could still be a serviceable back for Carolina um, and still be productive. So, yeah, I think this unit is, is deep. I think they are proven with their production on the field. And in my opinion, offensively, that's the strength of the football team. Then you look at the wide receiver position, and you had a couple of guys that really stepped up and and had some good performances. Rontavious Groves ends up scoring his first touchdown of his career, able to show a little bit of speed as well. That would be something we're hoping to see from him going forward. But really, just a fantastic story overall. I mean, of course, had the injury coming out of high school with the knee, and then ends up getting injured in last year's game against Duke. So... This is the first time he's really been able to have any sort of complete season. And, you know, to see him score, I thought was special. And then Jake Vargas ends up getting the Hail Mary touchdown catch, which we got to talk about that play in particular here in a minute. And then his other catch was a one-handed snag. So seeing both of those guys step up, seeing some of these other options sort of become more of an established part of the offense, that's got to have you feeling pretty good. Yeah, Toe Groves, I mean, I'll always root for the guy just because of the his perseverance to still be playing a game that's caused him two severe injuries. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's worked his tail off to get back where he was. You know, we were in the stadium when he had the injury last year yeah. against oh, Duke. Yeah. Wasn't Brutal. pretty. Wow. Um, you know, Vargas, well, that's a guy that we've argued has been the most productive tight end when he's been in the yeah. game. Mm-hmm. Um, to see more reps. But, yeah, I mean – the thing is with Larry Fedora and the way he's going to build this roster is the skill positions are going to have talent from top to bottom. So those guys, even if they don't play, can get in there and produce, and that was just another example against Western. Closing out the offensive side of the football, I just wanted to get your perspective on Manny Miles being able to come in, throws his first career pass, uh, of, uh, and ends up throwing a touchdown. Um, I, I mean, pretty spectacular, and especially to do it in probably the last game that his dad's going to be able to see him in. I don't know if he's going to be there for tomorrow's game, um, but it would seem that there's a chance that he won't, considering he has taken the Kansas job, and there could be some administrative stuff that he ends up having to go through. So, you know, being able to put, you know, that throw into the end zone, um, you know, I think there's two things that we have to take away from it. First of all, great for Manny Miles, a guy that's, you know, I mean, everybody jokes, oh, you know, he's the holder of the year. Well, this guy stuck around through all of this. And I mean, if he really wanted to, he could say, well, my dad's less miles. I'm going to go somewhere else and play because somebody's going to play me. He stuck around and, and really been an important part of this team. Morale wise, a lot of guys on the team really love him. So that was a special moment for him. The other thing that I think just has to be concerning for Tar Heel fans, I mean, maybe not going forward because it would seem like he might not be in the race for starting quarterback next year. But Nathan Elliott, this is the second time in two weeks that we've seen him pulled out of the game for a quote unquote Hail Mary. Both of them were within 40 yards. I mean, at this point, that has to concern you a little bit, right? That he's not even able to make 35-plus yard throws? Yeah, it's it's definitely concerning. You know, we, we've we discussed really all year long that the playbook's limited because of his mm-hmm. arm talent isn't as good as other guys on the roster. Um, and so that's very questionable. That's really not nothing that you can 
develop over time. I mean, you right. can't lift weights and just be able. It's just something where his arm just isn't. He either got it or he yeah, didn't. you know. Some guys can throw a deep ball. Some guys can't throw the five-yard pass. Right, right. Joe Flacco, for instance, in the NFL, has a great deep ball, struggles on the intermediate stuff. But, yeah, it's really dis- uh, it's really concerning. Another thing I took away from it was, why the hell did you not put Manny Miles in the Hail Mary against Duke and you put Kate Fortin out there in harm's way? I mean, I know it's whatever, but... He, yeah, I mean, I guess when you look back at it now, because they didn't use him against Western, it's really not all that bad because they can still play him tomorrow against State, and he's still going to be eligible for the red shirt. So I was just thinking, you know, if you know he has the arm and he's right, healthy, right. why do you even risk putting Fortin out there? Who there's it's, no it's way. It's a good point. Yeah, he's Fair point. even if he's eighty five percent, one minor hit, who knows what could do to that leg even more. So. But yeah, there, there's got to be some questions about Elliott's arm strength. I, I guess I think we all know going forward he's probably not going to be the quarterback, and so I guess there's not that much to debate about it. But it's not right. a good sign when your quarterback going into a rivalry game, the defense knows well if they have to throw it long to end the game, we don't got to worry about him. And the defense again, not the greatest performance that we've seen, but did a good job of slowing down a mobile quarterback once again. Defensive line continues to fight through what has just been a bevy of injuries right now. And, I mean, you look again, same normal customers in there, guys like Malik Carney and Jason Strobridge, who continue to have great seasons, but some new names popping up as well. Jake Waller had a fantastic game. Zach Gill looked great. You know, these are some of the younger guys that are going to be coming up through the system. And I actually had a question just – I think it might have been earlier in the week or maybe it was the week before – the guy was asking me, you know, why is Jake Lawler not playing? And, you know, I, I didn't really have an answer for him. I think it's maybe more just because of the talent that's in front of him. But it was good to see those guys come out and play. And, I mean, it continues to show that this defensive line in the future here could be pretty good. Yeah, I think with Lawler, I think he was a guy that uh, at the college level just needed some time to build the body and the yeah, frame Yeah, a little up undersized coming to, out. To, yeah. to, to yeah. play at the ACC level. But, yeah, the defensive line, even though they've been hurt, banged up, guys are just toughing it out, strapping on the pads, and going out there and playing playing football. And, you know, they've, they've fought their ass off. Um, it's another unit that, you know, when you think about defensively, that's probably the best unit on this team. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. No, I think you could make the argument it's the best overall unit yeah. up there with running back. They've been fantastic all year. So... It was good to see out there, there, you know, out them, out there. God, I can't talk tonight. Out there making plays, um, but I mean, you know, it's just another night where we have issues that it seems we just don't correct week in week out right. uh, on film. So, yeah, and then I mean, you look at uh, overall the secondary again, still, you know, having their troubles at that number two cornerback spot, but really, you know, another solid day back there. I think Miles Dorn just continuing to have a great season. Patrice Rene continues to play well as well. Um, you know, it's really just a health issue. C.J. Cotman cannot get back on the field no matter how hard he tries to get back out there. And, you know, it's K.J. Sales out for the year. So that, uh, that other cornerback spot left up to Greg Ross, um, who I think, you know, ha- hasn't been – I think he's been hit or miss. Um, they tried Corey Bell Jr. in there, and that just really didn't go all that well. So they went back to Greg Ross. Um, in the that they actually did that switch in the Duke game, and then they ended up sticking with Greg Ross um, in this game here. And I mean, you look at you know the other defensive backs that have seen time. DeAndre Hollins has shown a little bit of something, but man, there is one guy that you just got to continue to talk about, and this dude. This might be my man crush on this team. I'm not even – Trey Morrison led the team in tackles again, had another tackle for loss, another sack. I mean, this guy is just – what a start to his career. I mean, he has been fantastic. Yeah, he's just a guy that, you know, just has a nose for where the ball's going, can play with instincts. As is that, and It's not just all like – you know, he is athletic. He is, oh, yeah. you know, it's not just a guy that, oh, he's just smart. No, he can actually play with his just natural ability. So he's going to be a guy that's going to be a stud in that in that, in that that secondary for years to come. Um, and it'd be nice for them. You know, I think if the cornerbacks were healthier, the number two wouldn't be as yeah. much of an issue. I think Salesforce, he got hurt. 
had proven to get get better in the off season. Um, Cotman was pretty good. Yeah, CJ so, I thought played well. Yeah. So you know, I think the bigger question going forward is going to be where the question has been for the Larry Fedora tenure is the linebacking core because yeah. because the defensive yep. line seems to be okay and the secondary seems to be okay. It's just what those three guys do in the middle of the field. Can we get those guys up to speed? Yeah, and I mean, you talked about the linebacking core. I mean, the concern going forward, I think, with those guys, especially here in the future, is going to be, look, Cole Holcomb's not going to be coming back. And Cole Holcomb has been good, but he has had some trouble with missing tackles in the open field. Um, You know, he's taken some bad angles at times. But, I mean, look, you can't argue with a guy that's tied for the lead in tackles in the ACC. He's having a fantastic year. It's just that other spot. That really is a bit of a question mark. So, um, you know, when you look back at, at the Western game, anything else? Uh, the only other thing I could think of, Daz Newsome, a pretty solid game returning the football. So he's looked, to, I mean, he's at least settled down that punt returning spot that was a bit of a question mark coming into the season after, you know, we had Ryan Switzer. Then last year, Austin Prohl was there, got injured. You had MJ Stewart for a little while. So they seem to have settled that down with Daz Newsome. But a- a- anything else you can really, uh, r- that you want to get out there from the Western game? Yeah, the all blue uniform should be the default home uniform for games we play in Keenan Stadium because that's our best look. High five. Right on, man. That is, I, I yeah, you are 100% right about that. I am 100% convinced that that was the reason there were fans in the seats as well. I'll take it for what it's worth. You know, when, there we go. when I play NCAA 14, that was my default. Dude, that that uniform u- looked great. Home uniform. I think with the way that the sun sets in the stadium and it gets a little shady, but there's still sun. It Dude, just... with the blue socks was the best part, yeah. too. That looked, whew. That looked perfect. I mean, you know, I need to I need to cop me that look. That's oh man, that would be fantastic. But um, I think we'll move on from there, and let's move into uh, we'll go we'll go to one of the bigger storylines, and it was one of the articles that I wrote earlier this week. So you know, when I looked at it, you know, the, Kelly Bryant and Sam Howell both. Uh, with connections to Carolina at the moment. Of course, everybody knows what's going on with Kelly Bryant, guy that has decided to transfer from Clemson earlier this season. Now he's narrowed his list down. He did narrow it at one time down to six. He has since narrowed it down to five. Miami is out of the race. So that leaves Carolina as the only ACC team left in the race. The team's Besides Carolina left in the race are Arkansas, Auburn, Missouri, and who am I blanking on here? Missouri. Uh, how am I, I? I had these memorized right before we went. Oh, and Mississippi State. Yeah, yeah Mississippi State. So four SEC teams. Um, you know, the obvious connection would be at Arkansas because of his connection with Chad Morris, who was his top recruiter at Clemson. Um, you look at Auburn. If they ended up, Jared Stidham move on to the NFL. And then, you know, you look, uh, you know, Missouri, again, the offensive fit there. I I don't know how great it is because they've become more air raid um, during the late Pinkle era and now early Odom era, really since Dave Yost left campus. And then uh, Mississippi State. I mean, we know what they're all about. They want those dual threat quarterbacks. So I think he fits there as well. Uh, I think. Probably, if you look at the biggest threats to Carolina, I would say in order, it's probably probably Arkansas, then Mississippi State, and then I think Carolina's kind of in there, maybe with Auburn, kind of depending on what Auburn does, and then I think Missouri might bring up the rear. Then you talk about Sam Howell, who is a 2019 quarterback, uh, hails right from the Charlotte area, right here in Indian Trail, actually, down the block from uh, actually where I live. You guys know I've been covering him for a while now. Um, and, you know, this is a kid that is extremely talented, an Elite 11 participant, broke the state record a week ago for passing yards, um, held previously by Chris Leak, of course, who won a national championship at Florida. Um, you know, this kid's the real deal. He's about as good as it comes. So, you know, he, he reminds me a lot of Mitch Trubisky with his, you know, his, his throwing style, um, you know, his ability to run the football, just his poise that he has in the pocket. This guy 
really has the complete package. So, you know, it, it, it's it's an interesting debate here. Both of these guys, you know, Carolina's in the running for, and of course with Howell, you know, it, it kind of depends on which source you want to go with. They think that he could end up flipping to Carolina. I think what's going to ultimately determine that is where he's at tomorrow. Is he at Florida State or is he back in Chapel Hill? That's kind of a wait and see thing. But my question to you is, at this moment when you sit here, which one of these quarterbacks do you want the most in Chapel Hill? Because, of course, we had the Kelly to UNC thing. But once people found out that a true freshman, you know, or a guy that's a recruit in the 2019 class, and I'll be at one of the tops in the 2019 class, well, might be considering coming to Carolina. I think people had to take a little bit of a pause there and say, do we want a guy that we can build the program with or a guy that's just going to be a stopgap? Uh, what are you, uh, I mean, what are you thinking here? I think if you're looking short term, you, the you know, the obvious answer would be Kelly Bryant with the fact that this coastal is a mess. You get a quarterback in that can fix some issues on offense. The defense does enough. You find yourself maybe playing in Charlotte next year for an ACC championship. Long term, you know, you want Sam House. So that's what I want to look at. I'd much rather take a guy that we can bring in, develop, that I have to play right away because I'm of the opinion that I would redshirt him because you have Fortin or um, Reuter, you know, let you know, let Sowell learn the playbook, learn the offense, get a little, get in the weight room, get his body a little bit bigger, and then you have at least two years if you know, of course, if he decided to go pro early, if he was as good as advertised in the local mm -hmm. uh, Indian Trail area. But that, that's what I would rather have. You know how I feel about the whole transfer thing. I didn't like the Brandon Harris thing. I don't think that was the right move. I think Kelly Bryant's the same guy. I don't think he's the good as good as um, he was at Clemson. Once you take the, the talent and the coaching away from him, I think he's a very limited quarterback with his arm talent. We already have that in Nathan Elliott. I don't think he's that much of a difference maker with his legs, as you might expect. So... I would be of the opinion that if we can flip Sam Howell from Florida State to come to Carolina and have him for at least three years, I would rather go that route than bringing in a guy for just a year. I would agree with that. And, you know, I look at Sam Howell and I, you know, I've told you multiple times, and I just said it right here, who my comparison is. And that's why I think um, he would be a fantastic uh, guy to bring in. So, so I think ultimately that's the direction that they should probably go in, get a guy that you can kind of build your offense around, really a guy that kind of fits the offense pretty well. And the other thing is, is like, is look, they've been chasing this kid for a long time, since his freshman year. So they have a deep connection with him. I think this is the guy that Larry wants. And you said, you know, he's going to, maybe he comes in in red shirts. I'm telling you, this might be the guy that Larry is thinking. This this is the kid that can save my job. I, I don't know if, you know, how he would stack up against Fortin and Reuter. I'd be interested to see because, look, I think a lot of people forget that Jace Reuter was a borderline four-star. But Howell is also a borderline five-star. So this kid's really good. I'd love to see him in that quarterback room. I think he would bring... It de definitely bring some incitement around the program. I think Bryant would do the same thing as well, but... I, I kind of I feel somewhat like you. I'm not saying he's as look. He's not as bad as Brandon Harris. His legs are a lot more effective. I mean, he ran for over 600 yards last year at Clemson. He is a more effective runner than I think a lot of people realize he actually is. But at the same time, I do agree. I think he's a, a little bit limited with the arm. I wonder, you know, the drop off in talent, just how good he would be. And so, yeah, I'm going to agree with you. And I I'm going to say, look, if we're going to get one of the two guys, it's got to be Sam Howell. Bring him in and let's see if you can't build some success in this program around a guy that's as talented as Howell is, an in-state guy. And one of the other things is that's going to help you immensely with in-state recruiting that people can see you, you flip the guy that was committed to Florida State by really just the, I mean, simply from what we've heard from everybody, just the, you know, uh, what am I looking for here? I do this every time on this podcast. Uh, the intensity by which Larry Fedora and his staff has 
recruited him. I mean, these guys have never let off the gas pedal. Literally, for, he's been committed to Florida State since April. They have been on him every single day. They have been calling him, texting him. I mean, Larry has not given up, and you got to hand it to him that right now, I mean, with his persistence, it's working out very well for him. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I do – I do have to disagree with you a little bit about Kelly Bryant. I think he's – I mean, are you saying that he's he's basically just Brandon Harris second time? I mean, I don't – come on. He's not that bad. I'm just under the opinion He's won that, games. I'm just under the opinion that he comes in, all of a sudden we are 2015, 2016 back level on offense right. where we're scored 40 a game. We don't have the talent Clemson had. Uh, we don't have the coaching Clemson has on that side of the ball. And and here's my thing. When you look at the two, I mean, look, I know Howell would be a freshman. Do you really think that overall Brian is that much more talented than Howell is? No, I don't. No, think, I don't you know, either. I I'm don't gonna, think arm talent-wise he is. I'm going to piggyback what you said about the momentum recruiting has. I guess 2018 – the you know social media we see it a lot with for, with football recruits right. basketball recruits right. trying to get guys to come here you get a guy of that magnitude to flip to a team that very well could finish the season two and nine and the narrative and the recruiting for the program is going to change especially with the NCAA finally off campus you get that kind of player an in-state guy because normally these guys are going to Clemson or yep. Tennessee or Georgia all of a sudden we can use that. You know, then you turn around, you win seven or eight games, and you turn around and you win the ACC title game again. All of a sudden, there's momentum on the recruiting trail. Larry's not having to answer questions about his job to 18 year olds, and it's just a domino effect if this guy flips his commitment from uh, Florida State to North Carolina. I'm going to tell you right now, if he ends up flipping his commitment, I think that any of the talks about Larry possibly being gone are are just about off the table Um, because he will have done something that. It makes makes a splash, makes a splash, and I think gets people talking and gets some excitement back around the program. And I mean, if you look at it, it's, it's kind of parlays into one of the things we were going to talk about really quickly. Believe it or not, yet again, <laughs> um, because you know, look, it's a huge storyline going in. You know, he ends up winning the game last week. At this point, I think that most people are of the belief that he will be back in Chapel Hill next year barring a complete disaster tomorrow against State. Is is that where you're at? I mean, at this point, I, I think, you know, just from everything that we've seen, that's that's the direction at least that most most of us got to be leaning. Yeah, I think I've come to the realization during back-to-back tough years, I think this is Bubba's guy. I think um, you got to be willing to stick with him during the bad. Um, it it also, I guess, I'm not going to say hurt or help, when Les Miles agreed to go to Kansas, that was the fan base's top option. He's gone. Right. He's off the list. Right. You know, we were talking earlier, let's look at the group of five candidates. You're a Satterfield guy. I, I, I Yeah, I love I, I love Scott Satterfield, just I, I because think, of his connections in state. I think personally he stays, I think he stays where he's at and doesn't, doesn't want to touch the Carolina job. Um, Charlie Strong, I think, is a guy that would be a recycled power and group of five coach. Um, I think the man can coach, but is he the right guy for where he's for North Carolina? I don't, I don't think so. You know, you have Lane Kiffin who surprised at FAU in year one. They're nowhere near as good as they were expected to be this year. This year. Uh, uh, of course, the one I mean, we we've got our guy down there at Florida International. Yeah, and I would some be a, love again. I'd be all for a reunion for Butch Davis. Does it happen ultimately? No, no chance. They're I not going to touch so. him again. But yeah, I think I've come to the conclusion that they're at least going to let Larry see this thing through. Um, they've you know they've committed money with the facility, the stadium upgrade. So they're they're showing some more. I guess, desire to win in the football department of things. And and so I think barring a blowout or just something embarrassing, I think he'll be back for 2019. Yeah, I I mean, you know, I I look at the situation right now, and it's kind of like you said. You kind of look at the guys that are out there. And I think a few weeks ago, you would have said, you know, there there are going to be some names out there that we're going to be able to go get. Well, as of right now, I don't – 
think that Gus Malzahn's going to be available. Les Miles is gone, which was another name that a lot of people were using. A lot of people are thinking Mac Brown could end up coming back, but I've seen one of the scenarios, and I think this is what would end up having to happen. You would have to hire Mac Brown, but you would also have to have a guy that is on the staff that is basically ready to replace him at a moment's notice, because how long would Mac Brown actually be around? And then, I mean, we start to go to guys, okay, Hugh Freeze is one of the guys that you you suggested early on, and that now I think in both of our minds has become a name that we would both consider if we were athletic director. Um, you know, you look at some of the other ones, a lot of people want to say that there are some power five jobs where guys would leave to come to Carolina. I'm not seeing many of them. There's a lot of people that are saying PJ Fleck. I, I don't see, I see that as, as at the moment, really a, a, a lateral move or not really as much of a step up as I think he would be wanting. Um, and I think he's building something there at Minnesota. So why would he end up leaving that? Um, I, I, and then I don't really see any other power five coaches that could be looking to make that move to another mid-level power five job at the moment, unless I'm just missing on someone that's out there. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, and then you look at coordinators, everybody wants Brent Venables. I, I don't see that happening. I, I think Venables is going to stay there and at least until his son is off campus. Uh, and then, I mean, you look at Ryan Day was one of the names that you brought up. I like that one as well. And then it's the group of five guys, which you mentioned most of the guys. Other names to look at would be Neil Brown at Troy, uh, Bill Clark at UAB, who has just done a phenomenal job. But again, Bill Clark, an older, older coach. Um, you know, so that's the thing. A lot of the guys that are successful right now at the mid-major programs are older. Scott Satterfield is probably... I think that's the name that a lot of people are going to get hung up on. Um, him, Mike Houston at, at James Madison, another one that I've seen a lot of, which, you know, would make a little bit of sense. But at the moment, you know, maybe it is time to, you know, just see what, what Larry can do here because the coaching market has thinned out quite a bit pretty quickly. And, I mean, you look at some of the other jobs that are out there, you know, Louisville seems like they've kind of honed in on their guy, but let's say that, Jeff Brom says no, all of a sudden they're looking in some of the areas that we are. Same thing with Colorado. Um, I, I mean, that's the thing. Is there really a guy out there that you're saying is a can't-miss candidate at this moment? I'm no, just not, not seeing yeah, it. Yeah, not this year. I think we've kind of hit that lull that happens in, right. the, in the coaching carousel. I think the Mac Brown thing that would, you know – reinvigorate the program. I think the fan base would, would come crawling back because he's just a loved guy in the Chapel Hill community. But long-term wise, I, I don't see that being a, a fix. It, yeah. I mean, yeah. Jim Calhoun came back in college basketball coaching D3 because he has the itch to coach. I think if Mac Brown had got the itch to coach, he'd be coaching in high school or something like that where he's not having to spend the time recruiting That's the and other doing issue. all the other stuff that when you coach a, a a brand like North Carolina, you have a lot of responsibility. So, I mean, I wouldn't be against it, but I don't think that's the the right move to go. Um, and then you know the 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 coach at uh, Troy done a done a good job, but then right, again, it's right. it's Troy. I mean, and do we well really... that conference that conference is pretty good. You got to hand it to them; they've really stepped their game up. I mean, you got App State, Arkansas State, Georgia Southern, uh, Troy. So. I'm not saying the conference is good, but I'm saying that it is it is comparable in my mind to probably the Conference USA, which really isn't all that good at all. I just think what we're tired of doing is taking a either a a, a no named Power Five guy, right? Like I th I think you could sell the fans on a recycled guy who's been in a Power Five program. So Charlie Strong more, makes a lot more, of sense, more yeah. So oh, the yeah. guy that's the up and coming guy because. We tried that with Larry, and I saw a guy tweet out his record before we hired him. He was mediocre at best before the year they won the Conference USA, and then all of a sudden we were sold on him. So Right. I mean, one of the other names that I was just thinking probably will be a little bit warm will be Jay Hobson at um, – or is it, is it Hobson? No, Josh Heupel. Ho 
Ha Hobson's the coach at Southern Miss. Look at that. Uh, Hupel, uh, the coach at uh, Central Florida right now. That's a name that's going to get a lot of burn. But look, that's a guy that's a first-time head coach this year. So how much of that is just recycled over from the success that we saw under Scott Frost is the question. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, but I think, you know, ultimately what we'll be doing here in about a week or so, more than likely we'll be sitting here talking about our offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator candidates. I mean, is that safe to say in your mind at this point? Yeah, and I, you know, I've, I've, I've told you, and I've told many guys I've had this discussion with. You can sell me on bringing back Larry if he's firing the OC or just relegating him back to. Because I thought Kubilovic as an as an offensive line coach does a good enough job. To right. Him. But you know, I think you've said I don't give a damn if we have seventeen different offensive coordinators. I want one guy calling the plays. We need, we need one play caller. Defensively, something's got to change. Um, it's just not working with Papuchis like I thought, like you thought, like many thought. Because right. at Nebraska, he built top ten defenses year in, year out. I mean, the only – look, I'll give him credit for this. He has reestablished a pass rush that was just not even close to existent from Gene Shizik's defense. All I know no is way. that in eight years, we haven't stopped the run. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, and, you're and, right about and, that. And, and, and our division and our conference, we're still more of a run. If It's all about who can run the ball better. Clemson's good because they can run the ball. Most of these – Pittsburgh can run the ball. They're going to play for a conference championship. And that's the one team that we show up against in conference play. And then, I mean, this – to me, this is the one that shows it the most. For the most part, in the last couple of years – you know, you could say, oh, well, the run defense was skewed by games against Georgia Tech. No, it really wasn't. They had played pretty well against Georgia Tech mm -hmm. for the most part. This year against Georgia Tech, not so much. 461 yards allowed on the ground. That shows you right there that right now it's just not working. And the the thing, I mean, you said it about the offensive side of the ball. I mean, you need one guy calling plays. I, I think that. Larry says, look, we've had multiple guys calling plays ever since I got here. Well, if that's true and you want to keep doing that and for some reason it, it you think it's going to work and that's the only thing that's going to work for you, if you have to stick with it, you need a guy with a different, just something, some sort of different mindset. Because all of these guys that you've had around you have the same mindset as you. We need someone that does not have to rely on trick plays to win games. I mean, it's plain and simple. To me, that's what is needed. And, you know, we know the guy that we want if he ends up getting fired. And there are rumors that he may be out here soon because he really hasn't been able to step his game up. It's kind of been the same stuff for the last couple of years. If Cliff Kingsbury is on the coaching carousel I mean call him up and tell him what do you want to be the OC bring him in because Cliff Kingsbury is a fantastic offensive mind and I think would make just a ton of sense to bring to Chapel Hill yeah I mean I would buy season tickets I'd probably have pictures of him on my wall because he's the most handsome man in America whoa whoa outside here we my, go outside of myself the man crush level oh my god would would oh would be through the roof um dude I don't think this room's gonna fit this big head that we just got in here so yeah I mean my I think he'd be a, a great uh you know I've argued for him to, to fire Larry to bring that guy in because I think he could do the defense could do enough in this conference as opposed to the Big Twelve where he would win more often. Oh my god! So well, ultimately, well, I don't I don't see him getting fired on uh, uh, force, uh <laughs> as as it's going to uh. play out. But I would be all for them firing him. And then, like you said, you name the salary where you want to live. You have free access to yeah, I any, mean, anything because I think that could be a guy that could revolutionize the offense and get us back to putting up the numbers we expect to put up. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, I mean, he's going to bring, you know, what what drives offense right now in college football, which is having a successful passing game. 
And, I mean, that's the thing. Look, Larry's a guy that has lived and died by his offenses. If that guy's out there, why not make a play at him? That That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, and, I mean, for recruiting, this is the guy who coached Johnny Manziel to a Heisman as a freshman. So, he has that kind of brand that, okay. I mean, he has names. He has Manziel. He Baker. has Baker. He has Davis Webb, who went to the NFL. He's got a pretty good track record. And, I mean, look, and we'll do this probably next week as well. Um, because we're probably going to do it early in the week. So who knows if the decision will be made on Larry or not. But also, we've got to just talk about, you know, which staff members we personally would keep and which ones we would let go, because it's going to be interesting. There are a couple of guys that I think are on the fringe, but some of their track records will end up helping them out. We'll, We'll just say that, and I think we'll move on. So it is rivalry week in college football. And we want to take a minute to look at, you know, the rivalries that Carolina has. Right now, I think there are the three big ones. And then, you know, if you want to say that some of the other coastal teams are rivals, I don't know if they're rivals. I know they're hated, um, you know, like Virginia Tech, like Georgia Tech. Um, but I don't think they're rivals. The three rivals for Carolina, of course, the South's oldest rivalry, North Carolina and Virginia. That's always one that gets some consideration uh, North Carolina and Duke, of course, again, not on the same level as basketball, not even close, but again, a big rivalry. They're only eight miles down the road from us, seven miles. If you, you know, I don't know. I, I've never GPSed it. It's up to you guys to do it, GPS it to figure out exactly how far away it is. I always go with eight. And then of course the rival that we face this weekend in state. So my question to you is, who do you think in the sport of football, football exclusively, is Carolina's biggest rival? To start things off, uh, beating in-state opponents hasn't been the, the thing Larry's done. Oh, so that... we're, still ra- we're, we're still raving on Larry here. Okay, <laughs> one and three against ECU, Lawrence. Not good enough. Um, I think on the football side of things, when you look at the fans – I think it, it goes to NC State because their fan base is just as classless in football as it is basketball. Um, the games seem to be more heated between the two the two squads. You know, we were at the game two years ago. We had the the brawl or the shoving match or whatever they had at at in the first. Really, match. more just talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it but it fired the guys up. I'll tell you that. Much. Yeah, I, I think I think Virginia in the early days, like, and I'm talking early part of the program, was the bigger name. Uh, they would always play them on Thanksgiving Day and all and all this kind of crap. But that's kind of grown. Duke, like you said, eight miles away. They have the victory bell. But there was a while where Carolina, even when both teams were bad, just had Duke's number. Um, so I, I think state. I think the rivalry I think is closer in terms of wins and losses for both teams, and I think there's just more natural hate. Um, I know there, at least for me there is, and then like you said, the other teams in the coastal. Like if I just take another team in the coastal that I hate, it's just Virginia Tech, a fan base that runs their mouth for a program that's never won anything of significance. So. But yeah, for me, NC State easily is the football rival. Dude, it's getting hot up in here. These are the, the, it's it's getting aggressive. Uh I'm gonna tell you, yeah, State to me, um, probably the the most hated opponent. I will say, um, you know, Duke, like you said, that's sort of a newer, like it's it's got some renewed energy because of Cutcliffe making them successful. So, you know, you mentioned, I mean, before that, I mean, they, they've lost, Larry has lost to them five times before that. They hadn't lost five games against Duke, uh, or they had lost five games since 1989. Against yeah. Them. So, yes, again, you know, Cutcliffe has sort of, I think, revived, uh, you know, revived that rivalry a little bit. But to me, when I look at history and everything combined, I think, when you look on, if you asked on a national level, and this is what this came out of, because we were looking the other day at what we thought were some of the best rivalries in college football. I think that North Carolina and Virginia would be the one that a lot of national people would say would probably be the bigger one, just because of all the history that goes into it. It's the South's oldest rivalry. Um, So, I mean, 
I think there's there's so much history there. To me, I don't really think there's much hate there. Um, I think probably for older fans there would be. Um, it'd be interesting to ask some of the older fans and kind of see what their perspective is. And, you know, if any old, you know, older Toriel fans are listening to the podcast and of course want to, you know, chime in and, and, and give your opinions of, of what you thought of the rivalry, maybe back, um, you know, when you were in school against Virginia or, you know, even what you think, you know, who, who you think is the biggest rival now, anybody's uh, welcome to comment, of course, but I feel like with all the history and everything, I, I think uh, Virginia might be the one, shockingly, that gets the most recognition. But State, definitely the most hated. Um, just a ju- just a fan base that is full of complete morons that know. I, I mean, look, they they worry more about our team than they worry about their own football team. It seems so. You know, I'm not uh, – uh, to me, I don't concern myself with their opinions. It doesn't really matter. Um, to say they're classless is an understatement. Um, yeah, they, they just – they don't care at all about anybody else. They only – you know, they, they literally just sit there and – I mean, they cheered a couple of years ago for injuries to both Marquise Williams and Ryan Switzer. Um, that's just pathetic. We'll, we'll see what ends up happening uh, on, on, on Saturday. Uh, hopefully we're able to pull out a win. And so we'll turn uh, towards that game and really just focus on that. I mean, you know, we, we come in and in this game, look, I, you know, again, we're going to have to pass the football well. I told you this yesterday when we were talking, and this team is absolutely terrible defensively. Uh, their pass defense ranks uh, number 129 in the country, the worst out of all the Power 5 teams almost allowing 300 yards passing per game. So, yeah, they I mean, that's the area we've got to attack them. That's where Clemson attacked them and just destroyed them. And and that's what we've got to be able to do. I mean, if we can run the football as well, that's great. And I mean, the thing is, you know, in order to pass the football, you know, you still have one game left before, you know, it, in and and he could still be redshirted. Maybe do you go with Cade Fortin in this game to try to throw the football a little bit? I mean, I wouldn't go that ah. route unless he was healthy enough. I don't think he is. I just think they've got to understand, look, you're 2-8. and eight. You, you have nothing to lose but another rivalry game. Open up the offense. Challenge the secondary, you know, vertically, horns, you know, whatever angle you want to take. They're not good. Like, you, you're, you don't be that bad defensively just by happenstance. You're just not very good. Um, and this, you know, the steepest wasn't very good last year. Very overrated. Mm-hmm. Couldn't stop anybody. Same problem again this year. I think Carolina's going to set up the pass by hoping to be able to establish a run game early and often and then go to the play action stuff. But there's, there's no reason for them not to be aggressive down the field <laughs> With Ratliff Williams, Daz Newsom, um, Bo Corrales has made plays these past couple of weeks. They've got to be willing to take some chances and and, and understand you, you might throw some interceptions, but ultimately that we have a good chance to make plays down the field against these guys. Yeah, no, and I think uh, you know one of the other keys you got to convert on third downs. Um, you know that's been one of the things that we've seen. Um, you know it's, it's really. Both ways. Got to convert on third downs, and you've got to get off the field, especially when you've got this team in third and long. And that's the thing. You know, their defense might not be good. Their offense is good. They are sixth in the country in passing offense. Now, the thing is, they cannot run the football. So what you've got to do is you've got to be able to get after Ryan Finley, force him into mistakes, because in the games where he has made mistakes, they have not had success. They live and die by Ryan Finley. So you have got to be able to get after the quarterback because this is going to be a tough day for this secondary facing at least two guys that will be going to the NFL more than likely at some point in their career. And Kelvin Harmon, who is probably a first-round pick, um, he's as good as they are in the ACC. And then Jacoby Myers, the other wide receiver, uh, I think he's actually going to be in the slot. So that works out. Um, Emeka Mizi is going to be the outside wide receiver, and that's probably who Greg Ross is going to be matched up against. So it's going to be interesting to see what he's able to do out there. But I'm like you. Um, there's not any. There's nothing to lose here. This is not. Oh well, if we don't win, we're 
you know, we're out of a bowl game. You're not making a bowl game. Um, you know, why not go in there and ruin what's been a good season for state, but maybe not the season they were thinking about early in the year before that Clemson game. Why not? I mean, look, Wake Forest beat them. So it's possible to beat this team. That's the mindset that they've got to take. And you've got to go in, you know, there's going to be energy for this game. The stadium is going to be ready. I'm telling you, um, I, I've been pleasantly surprised by the turnout that we've seen at most of these games. And I expect a great turnout tomorrow for a game against state that could be extremely important for the future of the program. So, yeah, no, I think it's uh, it's going to be awesome, and I'm ready. I'm I'm ready to be there. Um, you know, any anything else really that you want to get out before uh, we we wrap this thing up? No, I think I'm all football talked out today. All right, man. So, uh, oh, well, we need to make our predictions really quick. Predictions, of course, presented by Hustle Hands Worldwide. It's a brand that, uh, you know, it, it, it really focuses on trying to motivate you towards whatever you hustle for in life. Go online to hustlehands.com for apparel and check out the Hustle Hands Worldwide Facebook page. You go there, you can get the apparel, and you can check out the podcast that my, that myself and Jamison Sharp do every single Wednesday. Guys, check it out for me. Also owned by former Tar or former Tar Heel, excuse me, Tar Heel fan Chad Boucher. So we go to the predictions. You go with the outright prediction. Why don't you go ahead for us, sir? Um, I don't know what the spread is. I think Carolina will keep it close. I think this is just a season where they can't um, they can't make the one or two plays in the fourth quarter in crucial games. And ultimately, when you are when you do that so often, you find a way to do it again. I think State wins a game to get to 8-3. and three. We fall to 2-9. and nine. I'm seeing 27-23, just another game that Larry would lose to them at home again on senior day. Another frustrating loss. Um... And one that I hope doesn't happen since we'll be in attendance. Yeah, um, you know, I, I know the line when it opened was six and a half in favor of state. I think we cover, and I'm gonna take us to outright win. I think there's extra motivation. I picked this game earlier in the year in favor of us. And I think ultimately, you know, they these guys know what's on the line. They know, look, they they see what's being written about coach. And they know, look, we got to come out here and fight for him because nothing is guaranteed when it comes to his job security. I think they come out and play a great game. I think the stadium really gets behind the guys and really pumps these guys up on senior day. And they pull out a, a huge win, huge win over NC State and one that ultimately I think helps Larry Fedora keep his job. There was a great article written earlier this week by Inside Carolina. They put it out again today. You know, Dave Doran saved his job a few years ago against us. Larry has the chance to do the same thing on Saturday for sure. If he wins that game, I, I think there's there's no way that they're going to fire him. I think he gets it done, and he ends up staying in Chapel Hill for next season. So, with that, that is going to do it for this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. As always, you can listen and subscribe to the podcast on Spreaker, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn.com or the TuneIn app. This week's game at home against State will kick off at 1220 on Raycom Sports Network or on ACC Network Extra via the Watch ESPN app. Jones Angel and Brian Simmons once again will be on the call for the Toriel Sports Network. That's 99.3 FM and 11.10 AM WBT in Charlotte. 97.9 97.9 FM and 1360 AM WCHL in Chapel Hill and 106.1 FM WTKK in Raleigh. For others, please check your local listing. Thank you guys for listening, and as always, go Tar Heels! Yeah!